Good evening and welcome. This is the October 12th, 2022 uh, public hearing of the Land Use Commission. The City Code directs this body to hear applications for map and text amendments, special uses including planned developments, zoning relief, and appeals from decisions of the Zoning Administrator, as well as to make recommendations regarding the City's long-term planning goals and objectives. Depending on the type of matter, this Commission will either have make a final determination or send its recommendation to City Council. Would you please call the roll? Commissioner Aravalo, absent. Commissioner Cullen, absent. Commissioner Halleck, here. Commissioner Hugo, here. Commissioner Johnson, here. Commissioner Lindwall, here. Commissioner Mirinchev, here. Commissioner Pactel, absent. Commissioner Westerberg, absent. Commissioner or Chairperson Rogers. I'm present. So with six present, uh, we do have a quorum. Also present tonight from city staff are planner Katie Ashbaugh, assistant city attorney Alex Ruggie, zoning administrator Melissa Klotz, and planning manager Liz Williams. This is a formal hearing and we do have rules that govern our proceedings. Most importantly, only one person speaks at a time, so all testimony may be accurately recorded. Anyone who wishes to address the commission regarding any matter on tonight's agenda will be given the opportunity to do so at the appropriate time. Commissioners may ask questions at any time. Our procedure is to hear from staff on the documents on file and then receive testimony and other evidence from the applicant or appellant. After that, persons wishing to make a statement regarding the matter will be given a chance to do so. Any person with a legal interest in property located within the defined notification requirements of the subject property may present evidence, reasonably question witnesses, or seek a continuance of the hearing. When all supporting and opposing testimony and statements have been heard, the applicant or appellant will be given the opportunity for rebuttal or a closing statement. Then the Commission will close the record and begin deliberations to consider the standards. The Commission will make formal findings of fact based upon the testimony and evidence presented, guided by the standards, the Commissioner's knowledge of the community, and the recommendations of staff. Any testimony is taken under oath. Although we do not apply the strict rules of evidence, Please limit your testimony to the proposal as it relates to the standards contained in the zoning ordinance and the corresponding staff memo. When testifying, state your name and address for the record and sign in on the public comment sheet. Our meetings are audio and video recorded. Please make sure that you are at a microphone when asking questions or making statements so that you can be properly recorded. All proceedings are subject to broadcast at a later date. Any matter not concluded at tonight's hearing will be continued to our next regularly scheduled meeting. We do have several items on the agenda this evening. Um, the first one being um, a map amendment and plan development for 2044 Wesley Avenue. Um, my understanding from staff is that this is being moved to a later date and a new notification will be sent out due to the changes in their application. So we will not be hearing that this evening. Um, but a new notice will go out to you when they do reapply. So look for that to come in your in your mailbox. Um, we also have 2222 through 2310 Oakton Street. The applicant is the city of Evanston. I'm assuming that's why you are all here. <laughs> um, in new business, we have 321 Howard Street. Is the applicant present here? I do not see him, Chair I, Rogers. Okay, they may come in as we move along. Um, and just a moment. Then we have a, an application for 3331 Dartmouth Place. It's an appeal. Um, is the applicant present? Thank you. And then the last item is an adjustment to plan developments, which is a text amendment, which will be represented by the city as well. Um, with that, um, I'm going to ask that anybody who may be giving testimony this evening to us be sworn at this time by raising your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth throughout the course of these proceedings? I do. Thank you. Um, 
And with that, we will move on to the first item, which is actually the approval of our minutes from September 14th, 2022. Is there a motion for approval? I move approval of the minutes. Moved by Commissioner Lindwall. Is there a second? Second, second by Halleck. Is there any uh, corrections that need to be made? other than I go back and forth between being Chair Rogers with a D and Commissioner Rogers without a D. So I don't care which one you use, whether Chair or Commissioner, but please spell the, the last name with the D included. Um, Noted, thank you, Chair. Thank you, so it gets confusing that people might think I'm two different people. Um, any other changes that need to be made? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Anyone need to abstain? All right, so with six votes in favor, uh, the meeting of minutes are approved from our meeting on September 14th. And now we will move to the first case on the agenda this evening. Again, noting that um, old business A, the map amendment for 2044 Wesley Avenue has been with, basically put on hold and will be re-noticed at a later date. Um, therefore, that takes us to the plan development 2222 through 2310 Oakton Street, 22 PLND 0025, and I will ask that that be read into the record, please. Case 22 PLND-0025 uh, for the property located at 2222 through 2310 Oakton Street. Shane Carey, applicant on behalf of the City of Evanston, submits for a proposed plan development at 2222 through 2310 Oakton Street to demolish the, one, the existing one-story animal shelter and construct a new one-story animal shelter with approximately 8,810 square feet of ground floor area in the I-2 General Industrial District and ORD Redevelopment Overlay District. The applicant requests a special use for a kennel and seeks the following site development allowances. 16 parking spaces where 25 parking spaces are required for the animal shelter or kennel use and one short open loading berth that is not located within the rear yard and is substandard in length. No changes are proposed to the existing recycling center building or area. The applicant may seek and the land use commission may consider additional site development allowances as may be necessary or desirable for the proposed development. The Land Use Commission makes a recommendation to the City Council, the determining body for this case, in accordance with Section 636 of the Evanston Zoning Code and Ordinance 92-0-21. Um, should be noted this item was initially posted with the on Friday, September 23rd for the um, September 28th Land Use Commission meeting. Um, that meeting was canceled due to a lack of quorum, so now the Land Use Commission is considering that case this evening. Thank you, Ms. Ashbaugh. Um, a quick question for staff before I ask you to come up. Um, why is this also a planned development instead of just a straight special use? The property is located in the ORD Redevelopment Overlay District, which requires a planned development for any new construction. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to get that on the record. Um, okay, thank you. If you'd like to come up and tell us about the project and begin by stating your name and address for the record. Does he need the clicker? Good evening, Chair Rogers and members of the Land Use Commission. My name is Shane Carey. I'm an architect and project manager for the uh, Public Works Department. <clears throat> I'm here to introduce the, um, the project for the Evanston Animal Shelter. This is a planned development for, for the properties at 2310 and 2222 Oakton Street. Uh, this project is a partnership between the City of Evanston, the Evanston Animal Shelter Association, and Cook County Department of uh, Animal and Rabies Control. The design team is led by Halliburton Root Architects and is supported by Connolly Architects, which is an animal shelter specialist, IMEG, which is an MEP, FP engineer, RME, which is a structural engineer, Terra Engineering, which is the civil engineer, uh, GSG Consultants, which is um, geotechnical engineers, Site Design, which is the landscape architect, and CCS, which is a cost estimating uh, company. So although I'm the voice, there's a whole lot of technical support that, um, that this project is receiving. 
<clears throat> so I'm going to start by uh, describing a little bit of the history of uh, this site. The site is located at the northwest corner of James Park. It was originally uh, a part of a brickworks factory where the brickworks was located um, to the west of James Park and James Park was uh, used as the, um, it's where they provided the clay to make the bricks. <clears throat> this, um, this site was, after the brickworks was closed down, uh, they sold this, these two uh, parcels to a construction company and it was used as construction storage yard and a junkyard. In sometime in the 1980s, I believe, I'm not sure exactly, um, the city of Evanston acquired the property in order to help clean it up. In 19, sometime between 1984 and 1987, the city of Evanston installed a dog pound. <clears throat> um, and that was on the 2310 um, address property. In 1991, the 2222 address um, had a recyc the recycling center installed. Due to the industrial nature of the use of this, uh, these properties, there are a variety of issues that need to be addressed that the city has been um, attempting to, to address for the past 40 years. Um, we will need to do some environmental remediation. There will also be some additional structural requirements for our foundation due to poor soils. There are nuisance trees that are located um, on the property. There are a number of outbuildings and storage is um, currently unscreened and um, yeah, and it's generally a very cluttered site. Um, the Evanston Animal Shelter Association is a not-for-profit organization that was, um, that was created specifically to respond to a request for a proposal from the city of Evanston in order to provide uh, animal sheltering for the residents' um, pets <clears throat> of Evanston. The animal shelter has four full-time employees but is primarily a volunteer organization. They have about 175 volunteers. Let me rephrase that, I'm sorry. Pre-COVID, they had approximately 175 volunteers and those volunteers worked in two and a half to three hour shifts. They provided care for the animals or they provide cares for the animals from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's the operation um, for the building, 365 days a year. Pre-COVID, um, their statistics were that they provided sheltering for about 300 dogs and about 275 cats every year. <clears throat> the number of uh, public visitors that come to this facility uh, currently is that they have about two to three public visitors per day, Monday through Thursday, and that is for their pet food um, pantry, where they provide free pet food uh, for people in need uh, in, that are residents of the city of Evanston. And this is an, an, an attempt to uh, create shelter diversion um, trying to keep animals from coming to the shelter in the first place so that they don't have as many animals that they have to find homes for. <clears throat> this number of visitors increases uh, during Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and it about doubles, so they have about six visitors that um, come to the pet food pantry. In addition to this, they have uh, public visitors that come uh, during the adoption hours that occur for two hours on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, I should mention that of the 175 volunteers, there are usually um, about eight during the busiest shift during the course of a day. Uh, here is an aerial view of the two sites. <clears throat> um, it's important to note that this uh, project has been informed by the Oakton Street Corridor study which indicated that we needed to reduce the number of curb cuts uh, along, cor uh, along Oakton. Uh, that includes removing the curb cut for the parking area at 2310 Oakton Street and removing the easternmost 
uh, curb cut for the recycling center. Additionally, the uh, study indicated that we should use the traffic signal that is currently uh, provides access to the shopping center that is across the street to the north of Oakton Street. Also, the Oakton Street Corridor Improvement Project is going to install a multi-use path along the north edge of our property, and we need to provide a meaningful connection to that path as a part of this project. Here is a proposed site layout. <clears throat> You will see that we've placed the parking area, um, the parking lot on the east side of the property, and we have provided access to Oakton Street through the existing traffic signal, and we have aligned the lanes so that they fit with that. In order to do that, we had to use property that is currently at the recycling center, which is one of the reasons why we are also a part of the 2222 address. <clears throat> Um, there are dog runs that are um, located on the west and the south side of the building. And there is also kind of a get acquainted dog run that was located on the east side of the building. The main entry uh, is at the northeast corner of the building with an adjacency to the parking lot and to Oakton Street corridor, or Oakton Street, uh, clearly identifying that this is where the main entry of the building is. Um, on the southeast corner of the building, we have an intake area, and we have the food pantry on the south side of the building. It is important to note that for animal shelters, it's really critical to separate the intake, where you have relinquishments occurring, and adoptions, where you have people coming in and adopting animals. These two experiences are vastly different from each other because one is very sad, one is bringing in animals that often have behavioral issues, the other is a joyous occasion where you have animals that have been, um, that are being rehabilitated or have been re rehabilitated. <clears throat> so it's critical to keep the stress level down and keep those two things separate. I think that that's all that I wanted to say on this slide. Here is a uh, landscape plan. <clears throat> All of the nuisance trees uh, that are on this property are going to be removed. We're going to be installing or planting uh, nursery stock species um, primarily along the south and on the west edge of the property. The light green area is going to be sod. The dark green area is a low, um, what is it, low mow or a no mow, low uh, grass species. <clears throat> Uh, at the main entry, there is a hardscape plaza. This plaza is going to include bicycle racks, benches, and, um, and a clear connection to the multi-use path. Uh, the dog runs that are located on the south uh, and the west uh, edge of the building are going to have pea gravel and the dog run that is, uh, the get acquainted dog run that is directly connected to a community room, which you'll see when I go to the floor plan, is going to be an artificial turf um, dog run. Uh, additionally, we're going to be placing some ornamental trees along the Oakton um, side of the property. There's a lot of fencing that is required for this project. And in order to uh, be cost conscious, we are trying to invest in the areas that are most publicly visible and provide utilitarian uh, fencing where, it's, where there's limited public visibility. To do that, we have, um, we're going to be installing an ornamental metal fence. I'm gonna be saying ornamental metal fence about 100 times. Um, and then we'll be installing an ornamental metal fence with faux wood panels uh, in the most, um, the most visible sections. And then in the back of house areas, we're going to be installing chain link fence that is black. Additionally, we will be installing a uh, trash enclosure that surrounds the trash and provides 100% um, enclosure, 100%, it blocks views. <clears throat> 
and, and the wood that is used for the faux wood panel on the ornamental fence and the, uh, the fence around the trash enclosure. And you also see some faux wood that's on the, um, on the building. These all are be going to be complementary wood products. All right, so on the southeast corner of the property, you will see that we have placed the uh, trash enclosure. <clears throat> I've mentioned a couple of times the education and training get acquainted yard that is located on the east side of the building that's directly connected to the community room. Uh, the surrounding fence of that area and the intake yard is going to be an ornamental metal fence with faux wood panels. Switching over to the northeast corner of the building, sorry, northwest, northwest corner of the building, we have another get acquainted yard that will be used by the public. That will be, have on the, along the north side of that, um, that yard, we will actually have an extension of the building that will be a solid screened uh, wall, screening wall, I should say, <clears throat> to block views to that yard from the, public, uh, from the street. In addition, we will have uh, an extension of that wall that goes all the way to the edge of the property where an existing chain link fence um, is located that is currently owned by Pace, our neighbors to the west. The get acquainted yard on the other three sides is going to have an ornamental metal fence. The isolation run, uh, the three behavioral runs, I'm kind of running down the west side of the building here, naming off these different dog runs. And then the two dog runs that are at the southwest corner of the building, those are all going to have um, chain link fence. All right, now I'm gonna talk about the floor plan. There's a couple of major organizational elements to the floor plan. Uh, the first you can see with the different color, uh, the red versus the blue. The red area is indicating a public space. This is space that the public is able to come in, uh, interact with animals that are ready for adoption, interact with staff. <clears throat> the blue area is the back of the house area. This is where volunteers uh, perform their work. This is where the animals are held. This is where animal storage occurs. But there's a clear delineation between the public space and the private space. Another organizational element is that we have uh, two different species that are in this building, and it's really critical for the uh, success rate of the animals to make sure that these species are separate. They have to be separate orally, they have to be separate visually, they have to be separated but from smells. So we are placing almost all of the cat, well, all of the cat um, holding areas and the adoption areas on the east side of the building and all of the dog areas are located on the west side of the building with a small exception of the dog intake which needs to be down in the north or the southwest east in the southeast corner of the building. <clears throat> All right, here are um, two of the elevations, the north elevation and the south elevation. You'll notice that we have uh, strong horizontal lines for the entire facade. The, uh, the facade is stepped towards a high point that's where at the kind of close to the main entrance. <clears throat> These horizontal lines and the stepped nature of the walls help the building fit within the context of the site and the surrounding areas. We also have a high um, canopy at the entry area to help designate that there, this is the entrance. <clears throat> and we have a clear story that's located over the top of the, um, the public lobby. It's really critical for retail and, um, and for stress to keep natural light throughout the building. So the windows are really quite critical. You'll also notice that there's a pretty dramatic shift from the areas where we have high windows and kind of a whimsical play of fenestration that is located on the north um, wall of the north east wall of the um, of the building. The the playful windows are located where cats are going to be housed, 
and the high uh, windows are located where dogs are going to be housed. And um, both species really need natural light in order to reduce stress levels, <clears throat> but views, being able to see cars, being able to see people walk by, agitate the dogs and cause a tremendous amount of stress. So it's quite critical that we control the views in these areas while the cats do not have that problem. <clears throat> In addition to the high canopy that's at the main entrance, we also have a low canopy that's located um, at the intake area and also providing protection for the, um, the food pantry area. The walls, um, the facade is primarily uh, brick masonry in composition. <clears throat> um, there is some sections that are in the back of the house on the west elevation and the south elevation that was going to be concrete masonry units. Also at the entry we will have faux wood uh, siding. We'll also be using structural wood that will be exposed. And oh and it's important to note that the clear story provides um, a natural uh, screening of the mechanical equipment that's located in the uh, on the roof that provides screening uh, at the north uh, to the north but we have uh, we will be providing uh, horizontal metal louvers to screen the east south and west side of that mechanical equipment we will also be uh, installing two signs there will be a large uh, aluminum letters, a uh, sign indicating that this is the Evanston Animal Shelter, and we'll be providing a smaller uh, aluminum sign panel that will have uh, the Evanston Animal Shelter Association's logo and name. All right, I think, oh, and those will both be located at, near the main entry, which is up at the northeast corner of the building. All right, there are two site development allowances that we are requesting. <clears throat> the first is that we want to provide a shortened 29 foot deep loading berth in lieu of the required 35 foot deep berth. We're, we have sized the intake yard very specifically to provide appropriate space to handle animals and to, uh, for the police department vehicles and for Cook County's uh, animal control vehicles. So that is what's dictating the size of the intake yard. <clears throat> Additionally, we do not get large uh, deliveries at this facility. Most of the, faci uh, of the deliveries occur with uh, smaller vans. Um, there is one delivery every week that occurs that provides a pallet, of a, one pallet of food, and it takes about 15 minutes. Uh, we do not believe that it's appropriate to size this berth for that 15 minutes once a week. We were not providing cover for the loading berth. We are only partially screening it as uh, that which is av available in the intake yard. Additionally, we're asking for um, an allowance to provide 16 parking spaces in lieu of the 25 that has been indicated. Um, the zoning administrator has indicated that this building, the category for this building that best fits is a retail building. <clears throat> and if you're to do the calculation with the 8,810 square feet, we get 25 uh, spaces. We believe that this is substantially more than what is necessary for the facility. Um, I've described how many people use the facility at any given time. We're talking about two or three patrons <clears throat> over the course of a couple of hours, three times um, a week, the number of volunteers. A lot of the volunteers use buses and, and bicycles um, to arrive at the facility rather than drive. There's a limited number of staff. There's a lot of staff, but it's spread out over a tremendous amount of time. <clears throat> Additionally, I'm gonna show you two calculations that uh, help reinforce our 16 space provision. The first is um, if we consider the front of house a retail space 
and the back of house and industrial service space, we do the, uh, the square foot calculation and we get 16 spaces. Also, if you remove all of the animal related area, the animal holding spaces and the animal related storage that goes along with that, again, and use the rest of the building as a retail space, you get 16 spaces. So I think that that's, that's about all that I have. So I would like to open it up to Chair Rogers. Yeah, do you have, do you have questions? I just had one, and, um, and it sounds like I, I had a bunch of questions written down when I read the original report, and, it's, and including some staff uh, concerns, and it seems like you've addressed all of them, I think. But I had one question. What is the property to the south, directly to the south of this facility? So directly to the south, it's zoned as open space. It is a uh, community garden um, that is uh, operated by the park district. Okay, all along the, park district, all, all park along the facade? Park. The entire so, southern edge is okay. this okay. garden area. Yeah, I, I, my question was questioning the chain link, but if it's that, then it's. Yeah, we currently have a chain link along that edge. And that's, these are dog runs, though, that, that are on the south side? Correct. So it, it, and if people are in the community gardens or, you know, whatever, other dogs don't, wouldn't that make the dogs go kind of crazy? Um, this is actually very see. close to the position that they are currently at, and we do not have an issue. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I had a question about the um, the future path the, on Oakton. Um, multi-use, the multi-use path along Oakton on the north edge of our property yes. so on the north edge of the property can you show me again how you'll accommodate for that future path or where so, it'll go and, and just reassure us that space is being left for that yes um, so the path is going to be located on the public way it'll be just to the north of the property line for oh. the 2310 and 2222 um, there is an outside chance that they will need to bump in to um, our property because of a bus depot. <clears throat> I say our property is all us, right? So um, we will be accommodating that in order to make sure that the bus depot has sufficient space for an ADA compliant um, uh, station. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> um, I have just a couple questions. Um, I think a lot of them have been already answered. Um, what are the hours of operation in terms of adoption hours? We talked about the difference in time when people are accessing the building. Um, what are the current adoption hours for the facility and are they planning to stay that way? So the current plan for the adoption hours is, um, or the current adoption hours are two hours on Friday, two hours on Saturday, and two hours on Sunday. I believe that it's like three to five on Friday and Saturday, and then it's earlier in the afternoon on Sunday. I could be wrong on that. It is available online. I didn't know if they were planning on changing them with the new facility. <clears throat> they uh, have not discussed that with me. And I, I don't expect you to know everything about the operations of the animal shelter itself, um, being a public works person. But I do, I would strongly believe that um, although they may increase the amount, the amount of time, they're not going to substantially increase. So it's not going to suddenly be an eight to five facility. They'll add a couple of days and a couple of hours here and there right. um, as appropriate. Uh, the, other, the other question concern I have is um, a lot of places, like especially in the intake area, there's one gate. Um, are, are there concerns? Has it been addressed? Um, you know, dogs are very stressed during intake in particular um, and tend to bolt. And so that's why on like a dog park, you traditionally have a, a vestibule. vestibule area. Um, and I'm not seeing that. Was consideration given to that? Was it? So the animals specific, so you mentioned, uh, sorry. At the intake area, the animals will be in a vehicle and under control when they come in and the gate will be able to be shut behind the vehicle. 
and that will provide a space. So the actual intake yard becomes the vestibule in order to get them into the intake part of the building. And if, if I'm coming in to, to surrender my dog, how do I know to wait to get out of the vehicle until that gate is closed? Surrenders are supposed to occur uh, by um, appointment. Now, that's not the only way that it happens, but that's the way it's supposed to happen. So sometimes people will leave the dogs um, attached to a post. Sometimes right. they'll, so there's, there's unfortunate situations, but the uh, intent is for, animal, for an appointment to be made. And during that, um, during that appointment making process, there's a series of questions that the Animal Shelter Association will ask the person that's relinquishing. Um, there's a whole lot of things that they're going to be doing during that process in order to try to divert the animal from the shelter in the first place. Right. So there's this relationship that gets established at that moment in time that's really critical to the way that the shelter operates. And then one other thing, I noticed on the, the floor plan there's a wildlife room. <laughs> yes. And I'm guessing that is I find a, an injured squirrel and I don't know what to do with it, so I take it to the animal shelter and sort of say, here's this injured squirrel, please do something with it. Um, is, is that the intent of the wildlife room? I mean, this isn't, a, <laughs> this isn't a place where people are coming and adopting wildlife, obviously. Correct. But it's more so if, if animal control finds an injured animal and can't get it to a, a rehabilitation center um, immediately that they can, they can hold it temporarily. You are absolutely correct. It's a very rarely expected to be used um, feature of the building. It was a specific requirement um, as a part of our right. grant with the Cook County. And I believe that it has to do with deer. Um, there was also um, an issue with pigs occasionally that they pick up. And so they wanted to have a space that would be able to accommodate that because there are not very many animal shelters that can. I um, helped find uh, a, an animal shelter for a, a bunch of baby possums and had to go to like Elgin or somewhere like that um, because their mother had been killed and people reached out to me and said help us find a home for them so that's where we ended up taking them but I'm assuming this is along the lines of if someone just shows up with an animal there it's not something that's being advertised or a service that's being provided but if someone shows up with an animal it can be accommodated at least temporarily yes okay I just want if anybody's looking at these drawings online and is seeing a wildlife area I just kind of want to make clear what its purpose just is out of curiosity is this wildlife area big enough for a deer <laughs> <laughs> we, we believe it is actually um, okay. we expect that the animal will probably be pretty stressed out when it's Would there imagine. and they will not want to move very much so although it's not an acceptable place for a deer to remain for any length of time the animal shelter uh, will be working very hard to move it to some place that's more appropriate right. very quickly. Can I? Are you, yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, with respect to the food pantry, uh, do uh, users of the food pantry make appointments? Uh, you know, how is that accessed? Is there a sidewalk? I couldn't really quite tell on the south side of the building. Yep. So, so we will be providing a sidewalk that goes from the parking lot to this uh, rear area. Again, this is supposed to be provided uh, via appointment, so they want they want you to call and then start a relationship uh, with them, and then they provide the food for free, and that's where you, you'll be picking it up. Okay. There is a that you'll actually enter into the building. You'll be processed and have a conversation, and um, and then they'll give you the food. Kind of in the food pantry area. Correct. And so, uh, if it's by appointment, then that could, you know, y y I presume that those hours would not overlap with the adoption. Uh, correct. Uh, so, it does which, not necessarily overlap with the adoption. Okay. Which and it's makes the parking the, better. <laughs> this is true. And it spreads, it's spread out over the course of the whole week, but um, two to three for Monday through Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, about six. Okay, and then uh, one other question with respect to the one pallet of food that's delivered. Uh, will, is there going to be an issue with vertical clearance for whatever truck is delivering the pallet of food so at we, the intake area? It is clear um, vertically at the intake area until you reach the 
canopy that is um, over the doors. So there will be a curb that will stop the vehicle. But there's sufficient vertical clearance for, yes. for that, that one vehicle? Yep. Okay. There is. Can I have a question? Thank you. So uh, regarding entrance and exit from the site, I see that most of your plans show only, let's call it the west property. Only the first and the last one show the actual exit and entrance, this one. So is it one and the same phase of construction that will happen over there so that you have the full entrance or you will stage it so that first you do the west lot and then anything that is to the east of the property line between the two properties? It's a little early for me to answer that question definitively because I need a contractor with logistics plan in order to confirm which site where they're going to start. Uh, my expectation is that they'll use the curb cut that's existing on the west side of the building at the beginning as they work on um, on the east side. But they'll have to they have to demo the existing building. They'll do that from the west curb cut. They'll get started on the construction of the new facility. But at some point in time during the course of construction, that staging is going to have to shift from the west side of the property to the east side of the property. And There's additional uh, phasing issues that we're going to have to address with the uh, contractor because we're going to be using the recycling center as the temporary facility for the dogs, not the cats, just the dogs. And uh, so we will have to maintain access to that uh, building and that site during the course of construction, which we will do with the, the easternmost curb cut until we can't, and then we will use, so we have to get all of this staged very And carefully. when will the, uh, let's call it, synchronization of the lights happen, the cross road lights? So the, the, that the lights are going to be a part of, and so will the curb cuts. Um, I probably should have mentioned that. I may have failed to. The Oakton Street Corridor Improvement Project is going to do the curb cut, all of the work that is located on the public way. That project is going to be um, performing that work on the public way. So the curb cuts um, and the traffic signal, that's all going to be done by them. And <clears throat> the traffic signal timing will be performed by that project. The intent is for that project to be under construction during the course of the summer of uh, 2023 so we should be aligned but there's a whole lot of okay it's good to be aligned <laughs> it has to be aligned thank Correct. you are there any other questions for mr. Carey seeing none I'll ask if there's anybody else here who wishes to speak to this but I don't see anybody else here so mr. Carey I'll just ask you if you have anything you'd like to say in summation um, before we close the record and begin our deliberations. Um, no, I don't believe so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, we will close the record and begin the deliberations. Again, reminding everyone that this um, being a plan development and special use does make this a recommendation to City Council. Um, but I'll ask commissioners if they have general thoughts on the project. Just that it's long overdue, so I think that uh, aligning the the uh, entrance with the existing traffic, you know, light that's there is a good idea. And I think that uh, you know, I think you know, parking should not be a problem. And if there was ever a problem, there is plenty of parking space in the the you know shopping center lot right across the street. But I don't think that they can use that. I would say no, I would say it's going to be more likely that if there becomes an issue, we have to talk about what happens on the recycling center yes. lot, which is also owned by the city still at this particular That's moment. That's true, but I don't think it will be an issue. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, okay. With that, um, we do have a set of standards 
that we must find are met, and we'll be going through two sets of standards. The first one I'm going to go through um, are the standards for a special use. I'm going to jump to those. Um, there are nine standards that we have for um, a special use. Um, the first one is that it is one of the special uses are specifically listed in the zoning ordinance. Um, we do find that a kennel is permitted in an I-2 district um, using a special use, so that standard is met. Number two, it is in keeping with the purposes and policies of the adopted comprehensive general plan and the zoning ordinance as amended from time to time. Um, we do look to rehabilitate facilities and locations whenever possible. Um, the specific animal shelter that is currently on the site um, is severely outdated, does not meet the needs, um, and desperately needs to be updated. So I'm glad that we're able to work with our partners at Cook County um, to find a solution for funding for this. Um, and I believe that it's long overdue, so that standard is met. Number three, it will not cause a negative cumulative effect when its effect is considered in conjunction with the cumulative effect of various special uses of all types in the immediate neighborhood and the effect of the proposed type of special use upon the city as a whole. Um, we do look, and looking at the site in particular, um, there is retail space to the north of it, um, a community garden and a large open, our largest open park um, to the south of it. Um, and it it's, uh, also has retail and industrial spaces to the west. And again, the park kind of wraps around to the east um, with the recycling center there. So um, I don't see how this will have a negative effect on the area, um, especially w with the improvement of the uh, curb cuts being removed as part of the Oakton plan for uh, uh, re revising Oakton. Oakton. Um, Number four, it does not interfere with or diminish the value of property in the neighborhood. Um, I'll just reiterate the fact that I, that I just said that basically this is an industrial area and has no immediate residence, uh, residential neighbors, and therefore it should not have a, a, a value on the, or should not affect the value of properties in the area. Number five, it can be adequately served by public facilities and services. Um, it's being undertaken by our public works department, so I'm assuming they will address anything that, that needs to be taken care of in terms of public facilities and services. Number six, it does not cause undue traffic congestion. Um, I believe it actually will improve the traffic in the area by removing some of the curb cuts and having the only entrance for the area be at a stoplight. Um, number seven, it preserves significant historic and architectural resources. Um, there really are none at this particular site. Number eight, it preserves significant natural and environmental features. We did hear discussion about the improvements that will be planned for the landscaping, removing several scrub trees and, and other um, un unsavory uh, landscaping elements and building a landscape plan for this area. So that one is met. And number nine, it complies with all other applicable regulations of the district in which it is located and other applicable ordinances. Um, again, I have no reason to believe that the city would violate their own ordinances, and so I believe that this standard is met. Um, everyone in agreement with my findings on special use standards? And with that now, we will go to the standards for planned developments. Um, number one, the requested site development allowances will not have a substantial in adverse impact on the use, enjoyment, and property values of adjoining properties that is beyond a reasonable expectation given the scope of the applicable site development allowances of the planned development location. Um, this is not a change in the operation on this particular site. Um, it is going from an animal shelter to an animal shelter, um, although it will be a better and improved animal shelter, but it should not see a drastic increase in the number of people coming or going from it. Um, but actually it's just there to improve the services that can be provided. Number two, the proposed development is compatible with the overall character of existing development in the immediate vicinity of the subject property. Again, and kind of looking at this as being more of a retail type establishment, which staff has, has said they view it as. Um, there's retail directly across the street and Oakton is one of our retail districts. Um, so therefore I believe that standard is met. Number three, the development site circulation is designed in a safe and logical manner to mitigate potential hazards for pedestrians and vehicles at the site and in the immediate surrounding area. Uh, we, we do see that the curb cuts are being minimized, um, removed, 
and that the, the increase of, of pedestrian traffic along that side of Oakton, as well as the automobile traffic that will be coming and going, uh, will all be regulated by lights, improving the safety in that particular area. Number four, the proposed development aligns with the current and future climate and sustainability goals of the city. Uh, we didn't really hear a lot of testimony on this, um, but we do see that um, instead of having lots of paved surfaces, uh, for example, that we will be, we will be maintaining natural um, surfaces on the ground where possible for the animals or the dogs to be using. And uh, therefore, I believe that is, that is done, as well as the fact that a building built uh, today has to be more energy efficient than something that was built in 1984 or whenever this one was particularly built. So that standard is met. And number five, public benefits that are appropriate to the surrounding neighborhood and the city as a whole will be derived from the approval of the requested site development allowances. Um, I don't know that the site development allowances in particular, but obviously having an improved shelter for uh, dogs and cats and potential wildlife in uh, the city of Evanston um, does provide a great benefit to people um, in the city by uh, both providing people who are looking for dogs and people who unfortunately must surrender their animals a safe and uh, quality place in which to do so. So I believe that that standard also is met. Um, is everyone in agreement with my finding on those standards? And I think I have one more set of, do I have one more set of standards? Or am I done? There are additional slides. I, I, as I say, I thought there was one more. I can pull them up in the code. <laughs> <laughs> I can pull them up on the, on the memo here, too. No problem. Yeah. There are the, I didn't know if you wanted to review public benefits. Um, in the compliance with the design guidelines for plan developments. Are we still kind of doing that or are we? Okay, it's still in the code. Let's look at changing that. <laughs> um, if you bring those up, I will run through them. Um, so the public benefits, um, this is, I can pull this up on my machine so I can take a quick look at it and I don't have to read those. What page are you on? 20 in the staff or in the packet. Um, so these are the public benefits intended to address the impacts that development has on the community. Um, first one, preservation and enhancement of desirable site characteristics in open space. Um, we've talked about how this, this being a, a, a former industrial space, um, it kind of will need remediation done on it, um, but it also will, will be maintained um, as green space for the use of dog, dog runs, things like that. Um, and that therefore the, this particular area um, is obviously not being paved over and made into a huge parking lot or covered lot line to lot line uh, by any sort of a structure. So I believe that standard is met. Um, a pattern of development that preserves natural vegetation and topographic and geologic features. Um, we've talked about how a number of the trees in the area are uh, less than desirable. And so therefore we will be removing those and replacing them with trees, hopefully that are more um, in keeping with the native species and trees that will survive well in our climate. Um, so I believe that that is done. And again, going back to, again, not putting in a bunch of artificial surfaces, but maintaining as much green space as we possibly can. The preservation and enhancement of historic and natural resources that significantly contribute to the character of the city. Um, I've kind of addressed this already in some of the other standards that there really is nothing historic about this property. 
um, nor is there any sort of a, of a, a natural resource that we are trying to maintain. Um, the use of design landscape or architectural features to create a pleasing environment or other special development features. Um, obviously, this is a much nicer looking building um, that kind of takes into account some of the surrounding area um, and is being developed in such a way that uh, it feels like it fits in with the surrounding buildings, at least as they exist now. I don't know what the plans are for the recycling center, um, but under the current situation, it's, it's a nice, basically tall one-story building um, that creates a, a, nice, a nice style that feels natural to the area. Uh, provision of a variety of housing types in accordance with the city's housing goals. Um, we will be housing dogs, cats, and I don't think the city actually addresses any of those in its housing goals. Um, the elimination of blighted structures or incom compa um, incompatible uses through redevelopment or rehabilitation. Um, as I've mentioned before, we'll be tearing down a building that is several decades old and no longer really fits the purpose um, that it was originally created to use, um, as well as the fact that we will be seeing improvements um, in terms of, of making the, the, a more modern construction that makes it a more efficient construction and it will comply with the city's green um, goals and the climate action plan that, it, that the city has adopted. Uh, business, commercial, and manufacturing development to enhance the local economy and strengthen the tax base um, does not really apply in this particular case. This is a not-for-profit organization that is run by the city but does provide a very important uh, service to the city um, and works with some other organizations in the area um, in order to try to keep dogs off the street and, and that improves the quality of life for people and their pets in the area. Um, the efficient use of land resulting in more economic networks of utilities, streets, schools, public grounds and buildings and other facilities. Um, I don't know that this really Im it matters a lot in this particular case. We've talked about some of the issues surrounding the improvement of the infrastructure that will be occurring along Oakton. Um, and this ties in nicely with that plan. Um, the substantial incorporation of generally recognized sustainable design practices and or building materials to promote energy conservation and improved environmental quality, such as lead silver or higher uh, certification. Um, I know that this does intend to file for a lead certification. We didn't have any discussion about at what level um, it was going to be done. Um, but obviously, again, going back to the fact that a modern building is definitely a much more efficient and environmentally friendly building than one that was built um, several decades ago. Um, so those standards, is everyone in agreement with my findings on those? Any more? <laughs> no. Okay. So that covers off on all of the standards that we have to run through. Um, was there... There were some conditions that the city had uh, talked about um, putting in place, um, those being uh, the trash recycle enclosure be made of a durable non-porous material that matches the building's primary materials, that all signage illustrated on the proposed elevation be subject to a separate sign permit review, and that the proposed wood lamp or the proposed proposed wood material on the exterior elevations be replaced with imitation wood or a similar similarly compatible material subject to approval by the community development department. Um, one thing that I would just add in obviously the first one, this being a, a facility that will produce a large amount of dog waste. Um, that the city takes special care to make sure that any enclosures are rat proofed um, because rats love dog feces. Um, it's one of their special treats and they will go out of their way to get to it. Um, so anything that can be done to help maintain uh, the security of that enclosure and, and, and the regular inspections of it to make sure that it, it does remain secure, um, I would add into that first condition. Um, any other conditions that people feel might be appropriate? If not, I will ask if there is a motion to recommend approval um, to City Council for the new animal shelter located at 2222-2310 Oakton. Sure. <laughs> 
Sure. Um, I move uh, approval of uh, the proposed special use and plan development um, application for um, 22 PLND-002522 to 2310 Oakton Street um, with the addition of the uh, three um, conditions uh, the, that the trash, rece trash and recycle enclosure be of a more durable, non-porous material that matches the building's primary um, materials and is uh, guards against uh, rat and other um, infestations, that all signage illustrated on the proposed elevation be subject to a separate sign uh, permit review per Chapter 6-19 of the Zoning Ordinance. Uh, that the wood that the proposed wood material on the exterior elevations be replaced with imitation wood or a similarly compatible material subject to approval uh, by the uh, uh, community development uh, uh, department so just to restate uh, I recommend approval of the uh, the application and uh, uh, by the Commission for forwarding to the City Council Thank you. It's moved by Lindwall. Is there a second? Second. Second by Johnson. Is there any further discussion? If not, um, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Halleck? Commissioner Hugo? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Lindwall? Yes. Commissioner Mirinchev? Yes. Chair Rogers? Yes. With a vote, vote carries. Of Yep. With a vote of six to zero, the motion is passed and it will be moved forward to City Council with a recommendation for approval. Thank you and good luck. Um, we'll move on to the next case. We still don't have the applicant, I don't believe, for 321 Howard Street. No, he is not able to attend this evening, um, so that you may dismiss the case or you can do a motion to continue to your next regularly scheduled meeting. I would recommend that we move approve or, or that we. Um, continue it for one one meeting because um, we don't know exactly why they aren't able to be here um, if everyone else is in agreement with that I'll just ask for a motion to continue it to um, is there a meeting that's better than any other meeting I think staff would prefer um, the November 9th meeting over the next meeting which I think is the October 26th um, okay. just because we already have several cases lined up for that meeting so I would look for a motion to continue the matter for 321 Howard Street 22 ZMJV 0073 to our November 9th 2022 meeting so moved is there a second 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 uh, moved by Lindwall seconded by Mirinchev uh, any further discussion Hearing none, I'm just going to do this one on a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? With a vote of six to zero, that matter is continued to our November 9th, 2022 meeting. Uh, there will be no notice, no additional notifications issued on that. Um, so that's when we will hear that particular case. Um, then we will move on to the next case on the agenda, which is um, 3331. Um, uh, Dartmouth Place, 22 ZMJV 0065. This is an appeal from the zoning administrator. Um, would you please read that into the record? Jacek Woldeck, property owner, appeals the zoning administrator's decision to partially deny minor zoning relief, case number 22 ZMNV 0049, to construct a six foot solid fence with a zero foot setback from the street side yard property line where two feet is required section 6467 f2b to allow the fencing setback less than three feet from the front facade of the building section 6467 f2c and to allow the six foot solid fence within the eight foot by eight foot site triangle that is required at the intersection of the driveway and the property line where a maximum four foot and 70 percent opacity fence is permitted within the site triangle section 6467 e the appellant was granted zoning relief to allow the fencing setback less than three feet from the front facade of the building and was granted zoning relief to allow the six foot solid fence within the site triangle 
subject to a four foot street side yard setback and was denied zoning relief for a zero foot street side yard setback. The appellant appeals the partial denial and requests approval of the six foot solid fence within the site triangle with a zero foot setback from the street side yard property line in the R2 single family residential district. The Land Use Commission is the determining body for this case in accordance with section 6388 of the Evanston Zoning Code and Ordinance 92021. A quick question for the zoning administrator. Um, which yard have you determined to be the front yard and which is the side yard? Crawford is the front yard and Dartmouth Place is the street side yard. So in, in summary of, of everything that was said, um, what is really in question is the appellant would like fencing somewhat within the site triangle and I'll, I'll let him go into more detail on what exactly that is. I just wanted to clarify that that although the address is on Dartmouth, it is the side yard in this particular property. Correct. Thank you. Um, if you'd please come up and state your name and address for the record. Uh, good evening, Yacek Vodek uh, from uh, 3331 uh, Dartmouth Place, Evanston, Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Vlodek. Vlodek. If you would please uh, tell us about the particular case. Uh, so we lived in Evanston for about 20 years. Last year we were lucky enough to secure this place. So we moved in, painted, cleaned it. Uh, you know, this year we started looking outside our yard and we said, well, nice open yard is a nice idea. It looks great, but we need a little more privacy. So, you know, we started our project and we ran into the problems with zoning and, and coding. So uh, could we have those pictures of uh, like page 162, 60 page in the packet? So I'll show you what we did so far. Hey, Katie, can you pull the packet to page? Yes. So this is what we built and this is what was approved so far. Uh, we set back the fence two feet from the property line because uh, well, I mean, we're trying to, to set it on the property line. The city didn't agree. We moved on to it. Can we have another picture, please? I'm having a hard time hearing you. If you could talk a little oh. closer. Did you say that this is set back two foot from the property line? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, that, that red line is uh, okay. kind of where the property line is. So, so that's set back. Uh, now, another picture is going to show the side. And then we're going to see the back of the fence, which shows the corner that's in the question. Okay, and a little more down, there it is. Yeah. So this is what was approved by city, uh, eight foot triangle that needs to be three feet high and 70% opacity. Uh, we build it just to, for the purpose to show how it looks. And, and now let's, uh, let's look at our goals, what we're trying to do here. Uh, we're looking to have privacy and no noise, which clearly that doesn't protect our privacy. Uh, and how, the, how this started is we moved the AC from the center of the building to the side yard. And the guy who was setting it up there, he says, are you putting it here in the plain view? I'm like, why? Well, people steal ACs in Chicago. You should build a fence up around it or something like that. Okay. So we were thinking, well, smaller, bigger yard, we decided, okay, let's, let's make it as big as possible so we can enjoy the whole property. So we started the process. In the meantime, it was mid-August or mid-July, I think. My wife was home alone. Somebody came, jumped on the AC, climbed to the window, and he looked inside of the house. So I'm looking at this small, tiny fence, and I'm like, this doesn't protect me from anybody hiking to my yard and walking around and taking wherever they want. So, so this is our grave concern. Uh, I understand that there is a problem with the safety when we are backing out our vehicle to the right of way. Uh, 
But I have to point out that this is very quiet street. This is a dead end, dead end street with seven houses on it. We don't have any pedestrian traffic across our house. People drive, they don't walk. So I think that, you know, our privacy and safety may be a little more worth than, you know, safety of pedestrians who are not there. Our car has a backup camera. I think this is a proper safety precautions. I don't know what else to do and how to sway the city's opinion to let me build a fence, you know, that, that will protect me and look good because I don't know if it's going to look good if we finish it in the shape that, that it's on the picture. I think that's all. Other questions from commissioners? Does it have to be a question? It doesn't have to be a question. If you have a question for Mr. Vlodek. I, I don't have a question. I, I just, um, I, I went to this, I went past your, your site. And I think, you know, it's, it's um, th there is no sidewalk here. And, and there never will, I, despite what is in the report about Public Works, I think, saying, yes, we, well, we'll plan a sidewalk. There's never going to be a sidewalk here. It Thank just you. doesn't, it doesn't require it. Um, so therefore, and I, I, I believe you when you say there aren't a lot of, lot of pedestrians because there isn't a sidewalk. Um, and I also think that this is a single car garage, correct? correct. And the code is written for driveways, which could cover a lot of, of um, different types of driveways. I think the, the issue is, is there, is there going to be, are there going to be pedestrians coming along a non-existent path? that are going to be hurt by a car coming out of that driveway that won't see them. That's the issue. Um, I think this is such a minor uh, a concern, and I think the bigger concern is the privacy of, of um, your yard. That's just my opinion, not a question. But Are there, are there any questions for the applicant? Um, I was a little confused. One of the uh, diagrams suggested a kind of a diagonal uh, uh, across. Correct. That this what's, was, you know, we were going back and forth, and I was trying to find something that would satisfy the city. city said, well, you can have the fence the way you like it, but you have to move back four feet from the pro property line. So at this point, I'm already using, losing 80, 80 feet of the property because that's the code. And I, I have to set back because there is a sidewalk coming. Now, another two feet is 160 feet that I'm losing just to get rid of the uh, tri triangle. I, I think it's a little too harsh. That's why I said, why don't we just cut two feet and two feet? That way we have four by four side triangle and it should be pretty big enough for the situation. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I uh, disagree with my colleague. I, I do believe that at some point we will have sidewalks everywhere, but. And, uh, by the time there is a sidewalk here, this fence will have rotted and fallen down. That could be. Um, but I am, you know, I, I live in a situation where I, I deal with the site, you know, blind sites both on, on streets in my neighborhood and my alley. So um, I'm fairly sensitive to uh, providing a site's triangle. I mean, that's just my particular. And, and I guess I'd like to ask staff. I, I understand that, that at this point, you know, the, the decision was made so you couldn't very well undo the decision. Is what is your position on a diagonal? At you know, with the with the two foot setback that it is. In part, we need to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. Um, the the true measurement for the site triangle starts at the intersection of the driveway and the property line. Okay. Um, so, for instance, where this is at, this is showing it already two feet two feet back. back. So you'd, you'd, you'd start the triangle two feet closer to the curb. Correct. So actually, if we go to the next couple photos, um, I tried to keep going until there's some, some red lines on them. There you go. Okay, so that's more of the true measurement of what the required site triangle is. Um, 
given that, there, there may be an opportunity to reduce the required site triangle by some. Um, it's ultimately what everyone might be comfortable with from a safety standpoint. Okay. So the distance between this, the, the driveway currently and where the fence is shown in this particular illustration is about two feet, is that correct? Yes. Okay. I just want to, I just want to give scale to yeah, this yeah, yeah. to this it's drawing it's because it's kind of hard. Right on the drive. Yeah. And then let me point out one more thing. Uh, you know, side triangle is going to be there, but there is this big bush in the back that that blocks the view, anyways. Are there any other questions for Mr. Blodek? Uh, is there anything, you can have a seat if you'd like to for a moment. Is there anything staff would like to, to add um, into the record? I think most of it was covered. Um, perhaps just to clarify that the original variation approval, it, it basically gave two options. It was either, um, comply with all fence regulations, which means the fence needs to be set back two feet from the property line, um, and then comply with the entire site triangle, or if the entire fence was set back four feet, then it could extend into that site triangle with, with the thought being that it's, it's only covering a very, very small portion of the site triangle at that point, just with how that triangle measurement works out. Um, so staff, did attempt to, to try to find a happy medium that would still ensure safety. Um, it just didn't work out that way. Are there any questions for staff? Um, hearing none, Mr. Blodek, is there anything you'd like to say in summation? Okay, he is, uh, just for the record, I'm going to state since you weren't at a microphone that he has no further comment. Um, therefore, we will close the record and begin our deliberations. Um, this is an appeal, and therefore, um, whenever we hear an appeal, we hear it de novo, meaning that we can review things that were not in the original decision um, and kind of view it as a case that's being brought to us initially on, on the merits that it has. Um, I'm getting to the uh, variations because these are different. So the standards of approval for a fence are different than our typical variation standards. Um, are you going to bring those up? There they are. There are three of them. Um, the first one being the requested variation will not be material or detrimental to the, to the public welfare or injurious to the use, enjoyment, or property values of adjoining neighbors. Um, this one is, I think, kind of where a lot of this is going to rest. Um, Can I ask a question about sure. that? What's the opinion of your neighbors on this? Okay. Have you asked them? Do we know? Let's, um, let's, we have to reopen the record if you want to ask questions of the, oh. of the appellant. Okay. Well, but I think it's, it's relevant to this uh, standard because it's about it's well about but, but, but it is and it isn't because the when we create a variance it stands forever and so people who live there currently may be in agreement but someone who comes later may feel differently um, so that's 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 why that I mean when we look at zoning it, it, it's it we don't take we try not to take into account the individual people who live in the specific sites. Um, so I I don't want to reopen the record unless somebody wants to override that decision. Staff did not receive any letters of objection or support. Okay. Um, so this is this is the one where I think kind of the the crux of it is. Um, in terms of of the the potential public welfare and injurious use um, of the area, um, the site triangles are created with an intent um, to try to prevent people from suddenly appearing um, from behind a fence into a driveway. 
Um, and so I, I think we should have some level of, of a site triangle. Um, is the, is the eight foot necessary? Um, we've already seen that it's been moved back two feet already, um, which would create basically a six foot difference that we're talking about now. Um, we've heard from the city that they intend to put a sidewalk here, although there seems to be some discussion about whether that will happen or not. Um, but I do not believe that this standard has been met. Um, and I would be willing to, as we move further, to discuss how we can make it met through some mediation of um, coming to an agreement um, for something that isn't as strict as the letter of the law, um, but also is not quite as loose an interpretation as allowing it to exist in the space that the uh, appellant is looking to place it. Um, the second one being the additional screening, additional height, or requested location achieved through the variation will assist in reducing noise, screening incompatible adjacent uses or increased safety to the owners or the subject property or budding properties. Obviously, um, having a six-foot fence is the best in terms of security. Um, it's very difficult for most people to scale a six-foot fence, um, although it can be done. Um, it also does provide a level of screening so that people can enjoy their properties, especially people who live on a corner um, in which their side yard or their rear yard um, becomes part of the public viewing from the public way, unlike a traditional home in which the backyard is screened from the public way. Uh, I believe this standard is met. Number three, in no event shall a variation be granted that would permit a fence taller than 30 inches to be located within 20 feet of the corner curb line of an intersection. Um, this is not applicable because this is not a, a corner intersection. This is a driveway intersection that we're looking at. Um, so I don't believe that this standard applies in this particular case. Um, so that's, that's my findings on the standards. Um, I know there's going to be some discussion and disagreement on those. So let's, let's have that discussion now. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, I agree with your findings, Chair. It, standard A, I don't see that as being met. Um, the detrimental to the public welf welfare part, um, I just want to second what um, Commissioner Linwell said about you know, safety, safety to pedestrians. Um, you know, the, the, haven't brought up yet children um, walking in areas of the city where there are blind corners, where there are fences, that kids that don't pay attention to where they're going, kids that are short, that a, a driver isn't necessarily, go necessarily going to see. Um, so that's, that's a concern, that's an additional concern I wanna raise, but in general, I, I agree with your findings, and I, I really don't think um, standard A is met. Commissioner Hugo? So on the sidewalk issue, it, it, do we know when it's, when are they planning on putting in a sidewalk? Is this just a theoretical issue? It could be in the future at some point? I don't, I don't think there is a, a date certain for, for any sidewalk improvements. It's, a, it's, a, it's an initiative the city is undertaking, um, but it's not like, next summer this is going to occur or in even five years summer this is going to we have occur. a sense where this is on the city's priority is sort of um, dead, dead end streets in a area where you no know, traffic is that high on the priority i mean whether it's relevant to this discussion or not, i don't know but sure my my understanding um liz williams planning manager uh thank you so my understanding from speaking with our um, city engineer is that the city council has recently passed um, some resolutions to essentially develop a plan to install sidewalks across the city. Um, so staff is currently working on that plan. Um, it is going to take time, um, but, but that, that is something that they have been directed to do. So I can't tell you for certain because it hasn't yet been finalized when those sidewalks would be installed. So as a matter of process, is it possible to grant a this variance with the understanding that if a sidewalk were to be put in, it would then have to drop down to comply with the site triangles and all that? Because then it does become a practical safety issue. Because right now it's kind of it's theoretical. I mean, that's that's within our ability to 
to condition that, I would think. Yeah, except um, that once once but, a fence but, is in, I mean, it's not you know it's it's not likely to be changed. Right. That uh, Katie Ashball planner, if I may, um, it would be rather challenging condition for staff to enforce, um, knowing the timing of when the sidewalk is being improved and when the fence should be lowered and um, you know should the current property owner no longer reside there and own the property and telling a future property owner sorry you have to reduce your fence um, that may be a little problematic so um, from an enforcement and administration of that we would advise against that. Maybe we should discuss uh, compromise here because I think that's, the that's what, I, I think the um, as the zoning code reads, it's a little ridiculous for this situation. I personally think. However, I think safety is important, and and if there's one child that gets run over by a car in this situation, I mean that's that's horrible. Um, so what can we do? What can we recommend that is reasonable? that would still give this gentleman a secure yard of of a decent size, you know. That doesn't take too much out of your property. I mean, I would I would like us to try to find something that works here. I don't know that we need to go with the with the full 8 feet especially with the with the with the 2 feet that's already being set back. Um yeah, and close yeah. there. It seems to me that you know, on, on you know, looking at the zoning, the alley and alley intersection that requires a three-foot site triangle. You know, I, I frankly, I would be happy with like a four-foot and then a diagonal, a, a four-foot uh, sight line. But, and again, you have to remember it's from the property line, not where the fence is, because they've but already. This isn't an alley. No, it's no, not it's an not. alley. Right. But but she's saying but the I'm alley, just saying the, that's the standard for an alley. And, the, and the alleys are a little more loose because typically you are driving forward down an alley as opposed to backwards down an alley. And um, they're so also I'm that's quiet. And, and they're also quieter. Yeah. I mean, there's there's the you know in terms of the traffic, it's probably more la analogous to. Mm -hmm. No, I, I would say that's not okay. Not the case. Because um, the, the main the main traffic is going to be on a street, right? Um, and it's the intersection of the street that doesn't see as much traffic. Um, but you're also backing out, right. In this particular case, and as you said, in an alley, you're generally driving forward. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to Commissioner Halleck for a moment because he's a an architect. Um, and I don't want I don't want to create an issue that becomes more troublesome than it is. Um, obviously, if we were to go with like a four foot sight triangle, that would require basically a two foot diagonal um, across there as it currently stands, because um, they already have two feet and two feet, so you're four, foot and four. four foot and four foot, and then that creates. A small diagonal cut there, which doesn't take a lot of the property, but does increase some level of sight line. Um, but I, I don't know if that creates any issues in terms of building the fence. I wouldn't think it would. Um, yeah, I, I just want to make sure because yeah, I just want to make sure that that would not create an issue uh, um, in any way. Um, so I would be willing to propose a four foot. Um, site triangle if 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 everyone feels that's a, a a compromise and again that would be two feet in from where the current fence structure stands or is proposed so it's four feet from the property line four feet from the driveway is that uh, guy I'd like to get kind of staff's reaction to that if I mean I'm sure you've been looking at what might be feasible and what that's similar to what the original variation was granted um, by increasing the the whole street side yard setback to four feet. So you're 
you're using similar thinking. Okay, and then that would allow if we if we have the diagonal for the diagonal fence that then would allow a six foot fence. Yes. So that would that we wouldn't we wouldn't be putting in a seventy percent opacity. We wouldn't be putting in um, a three foot height or a four foot height, whatever it, it is required there. So it would require a six foot fence. Um, the entire the entire run of the fence, including the diagonal. Right, because the the you know the fence is already there, set back two feet. Right. So we're you know so the of the three uh, variations requested, you know we're really down to the site triangle. That's right. the only it's the only thing that, you know section of the fence that's at issue. Right. If I understand this correctly. Yep. Um, is that in general consensus with? Everybody feeling that that is a, a good compromise? Commissioner Halleck is drawing. Yeah. Ticket. I, I didn't know if you were sketching something out or. Okay. Okay. Um, so, with that, I will ask is there a motion um, to basically uh, uh, grant the appellant? The right to build a his a, a six foot continuous run fence, um, with the agreement that the site triangle would be set back four feet from the prop where the property line meets the driveway. So it's four feet from the driveway and four feet from the property line, and then he can diagonal that enclosure. And I'm not good with math, but it would be whatever the long side of the right triangle would be, there would be the diagonal. When I draw a picture of that, it, it, it makes more sense to me to, because it's already set back two feet, to have um, an additional two feet on the south and then two feet off the driveway and then that diagonal. Um, so this would, seems, be, this would be if you it, did. And the reason I say that is because it seems like it achieves the same thing. Right. Right. You're, you're looking, see, can you so, see what I'm so drawing? That's, that's my drawing. The, the the issue the issue is the um, pedestrian to driver yeah. and and I I just don't know that an addition an additional two feet from the from the driveway is going to help it that much I, I I just don't see it um, it, it seems like if if nothing if nothing else it creates a place for someone to get out of the way if a car is backing. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's it's only more room on the side of the car. It has nothing to do with the um, the 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 diagonal. Should I? It doesn't improve the sight line. See, as otherwise it'd be here. Right, exactly. And so it's this angle. So that the, that's two feet. Steeper, and that's you want a steep angle. You want this to be as steep as possible so you can see the pedestrian walking. From here. Here's yeah, the exactly, pedestrian. Exactly. Yeah. So you want this to be as steep as and that's what you get the four feet. There's just two dust Yeah, but, but that's four feet here. For so four that's what we're saying. Four feet from the property line, two feet from where the fence is right now, and then two feet from the Right, it's, but it's a four foot total because he's already in two feet from where. But not, he needs from, the to be. not from the driveway. Not from the driveway. I'm saying I'm saying four feet from the property line and two feet from the driveway. Right. That's not what I'm saying. I know. <laughs> I'm just saying that I think that that, that I I would I would say that that accomplishes what we want to accomplish, which is to improve the view from the. Um, from the driver to the pedestrian or pedestrian to the driver or the car. I, I, I look, 
Whatever you guys. That, that's what I would suggest. Someone could could suggest that we could vote I, on I, both I, I like the four feet and four feet. Is All right, my. fine. I, I, I give up. I, I just think this is a very unusual situation. There is no sidewalk here there is no there's plants there's you can't even walk in this in this area and we're worried about kids i just don't get it but um and it's a dead-end street but, but george the, the ordinance is the ordinance and the ordinance doesn't say okay. you don't have a sight line if you're on a dead-end street and there's not a sidewalk I, i'm just speaking practically yeah, yeah. i understand the ordinance Sorry. We're trying to come to a compromise here, and I, I think two four. I would support two two feet from the driveway, four feet from the from the. From the it's it gets you the sight line, and it, you know if we're trying to find a compromise, and by definition we're sort of moving away from the ordinance, right? So uh, yeah, that would be my view. I would support what Commissioner Howick has just outlined. Um, I think I think four feet four feet is a compromise. And that's what that, that that's half of what what is required by the ordinance. So that's where I would like to go. Um, so I will ask if there is a motion for that. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, motion to Commissioners, can you hold on for one second? We are legally checking something. Okay. As a reminder to commissioners, as you are the final determining body, you have to have six concurrent votes to wrap up the case. Yep. Just a reminder. Yep. Which means we all have to agree tonight, or else <laughs> it, is, it is carried over um, until we can get the remainder of the votes. Um, was, that, was that all we were checking legally? I could have told okay, you Okay, there you go. You can make your motion. <laughs> um, so I will, I will return to Commissioner Johnson, um, who I believe was about to make a motion. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I move in the case of uh, 22ZMJV-0065 um, that we approve a four foot by four foot site triangle at that uh, intersection uh, that we're speaking of the driveway and the property line. So it's been moved by Commissioner Johnson. Is there I'll a second? Se second by Commissioner Lindwall. Is there any further discussion? If not, I will ask for a roll call vote on this one. Commissioner Halleck? Commissioner Hugo? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Lindwall? Yes. Commissioner Miranchev? Yes. Chair Rogers? Yes. Um, so with six votes, um, the motion does carry. And the applicant is approved, or the appellant in this particular case, is approved for a four foot by four foot setback um, for the site triangle um, at the location of uh, 33, or th 331 Dartmouth. Okay, thank you. And thank you to all the commissioners for not making him have to come back and wait for additional votes to come weeks in the future. Um, I appreciate that, and I'm also glad that we were able to reach a compromise. Uh, with that, we will move on to the last item that we have on the agenda this evening, um, which is a text amendment. Um, this is a text amendment that we referred to staff to look into. As many of you recall, the, um, the situation at 999 Howard, the Ann Rainey Apartments, um, in which we were asked to look at the um, change of the facade. And there was a lot of discussion about um, whether it should be before us, what was a minor, what was a major, uh, a text, or, I'm sorry, what was a minor or major adjustment to a plan development. And we had given some direction to staff to come up with something, and they are here to present that. So with that, Ms. Klotz, would you read it into the record? 
City initiated text amendment to the zoning ordinance, Title VI of the City Code, to clarify and modify the process for adjustments to planned adjustments to development plans for planned developments. Section 63612. The Land Use Commission makes a recommendation to the City Council, the determining body for this case, per Section 6346 of the Evanston Zoning Code and Ordinance 92021. As Chair Rogers indicated, this text amendment came about through a referral from this commission. And ultimately that came about because our current process um, lists very specific things that qualify as minor adjustments, things that rarely to never come up, and everything else automatically is considered a major adjustment that then runs through um, DAPR and this commission and then on to city council. Um, staff is proposing slight changes so that major adjustments are considered any change in a development plan that creates a new site development allowance or any change that increases the degree of an already approved site development allowance. Um, with those, it, the the major adjustment would come to the Land Use Commission um, and, and be heard and the changes would, um, would, be her, would be determined according to the standards that apply to plan developments. On the other hand, we are proposing that mi minor adjustments are anything that are not related to site development allowances or that decrease site development allowances and we are uh, requesting a change in that process so that rather than it being determined by the zoning administrator where it could then be appealed and end up in a circular process, instead it would bypass the Land Use Commission since it is not related to site development allowances or is only reducing and it would go straight to the Planning and Development Committee and City Council for a final determination. Overall, um, the time frame for major adjustments would stay the same, but would apply to fewer requests essentially. And the process for minor adjustments would slightly increase the time since we would be um, changing the final determination to the city council. I've got a question. I, I thought one of the big issues was that we don't want to be presented with a fait accompli. And how do you prevent that? I thought that was really what we were talking about. In other words, um, the, what happened was someone comes to us and says, well, we had these issues come up and so we had to change the facade. But we, you know, um, and then here we are and it's built. So, so I think there's two different, there's two separate issues. And that's really a process issue that I don't know that we can really change. Really? I mean, how, do, how else we just deny people when they've made that change? And or city council denies people when they make that change. Well, but I, I thought th that's the situation we don't want to get into. I thought that what we wanted to do is create a, pr a process, yes, a process where um, there would be an interim review of during construction because what happens now is that is that a, a, an applicant uh, uh, gets a permit and it's based on certain drawings that the next time they're reviewed is when the building's built and they they want an inspection so so my question to you is is there an ordinance that covers that that we have purview over C correct I think um, chair Rogers in his statements is accurate I think that that is more of an administrative procedural item that we would need to address not a codified requirement um, because we don't typically codify in the zoning ordinance, our inspection, you know, um, how we do inspections as a city. So I think that that's something we could do administratively to make that change to, you know, do an interim, you know, check as it relates to compliance with the development plans um, during the, d the construction of that. And I don't think that's something that a text amendment would need to basically codify it's more of an administrative operational change okay. that we need to make I, I just think that that's totally noted yeah I, I totally 
understand where your point is coming from that, you know, obviously we want to be as proactive as we can in ensuring compliance with approved plans. Um, but I, I think the intent here was to really talk about the process of what triggers a major versus minor, at least that was our understanding of the chair's um, referral to us. Mm -hmm. The other issue was that they, had, they changed the facade and it was a smaller building. Um, and it, it, so maybe that wasn't significant in that sense, but it, it could have applied to a high-rise building. And um, to make that change in a facade a minor change, I find to be a little odd. It is, you know, I, I understand your point in terms of the terminology of minor being maybe not significant, but it will still go to the city cult. Uh, City Council, which is ultimately the determining body for plan developments when they're issued in the first place. So it's not as if there wouldn't be some sort of process or public body that would be reviewing those changes um, to grant them. Because our, our purview isn't specifically facade design? Is that the reason why? It's skipping us? I believe that was some of the points of the commission that was made previously, and I think this this is part of the discussion you have to have I, um, in terms of I, whether I, or not this addresses I, I the referral. I think part of where we were going with this is if you look at what is listed as a minor adjustment currently, it involves moving the building, cutting green space, all this sort of stuff, which doesn't come to us. I would much rather see those things come to us if those are site allowances that are granted. Um, you know, a facade is important, and by, by moving it into a minor doesn't mean that the zoning administrator just says, yeah, go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. um, it still has to go through the process. It just doesn't come to us. It goes through planning and development and city council um, in the typical fashion. Commissioner Lindwall? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that in terms of separating major adjust and minor adjustment, you know, it makes sense to have the you know the major focus on the uh, changes, increases in site development allowances or density or whatever they decide to do uh, versus uh, the materials. However, I think that probably, you know, it's important to note, you know, the land use commission we do deal with with building materials and design guidelines. I mean, there's a whole set of plan development design guidelines that are in our purview. And we're probably in a better position to, to look at those versus the city council. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I think that this makes sense, but I share your concern that, that really, you know, the the change is supposed to be requested by the developer and in the last you know the, with the Ann Rainey apartments the developer didn't request any change and should have and and that's that's the dilemma is is how uh, you build into the you know the administrative process you know something where you catch those because I mean you know the options then are to you know have the city not grant the you know not grant the occupancy permit at which point you end up in court you know being litigated which to the extent possible i think we'd all like to see uh you know that not be the case um i do have one question about the process uh in in terms of the major adjustment obviously there's public notice and and the whole you know all the zoning proof uh procedures are followed uh, it, with the uh, minor adjustment are there any notices that you're anticipating or would it just go be on the you know planning and development committee and city council agendas as proposed there would not be any notice um, that is additional notice, that, additional right. notice that, that is something that you could add in if desired yeah I don't know that you know, the city council could decide to, to answer, you know, to do that. I presume that once the city council has adopted a, I, I, you know, I guess again it gets back into what the major adjust or the minor adjustment would be and whether or not that would be a desirable, you know, courtesy notice. I mean, all, all city council meetings are publicly noticed. 
So if we're looking at adding an additional notification of mailing a postcard to everyone. I don't know that that necessarily. That's, that's kind of what we're, that, yeah. that's, that's another part of this process. I want us to kind of move outside of just looking at the one property we've done this on. Right. Because there's another property in the city that's being developed that is running into the exact same problem in that uh, my understanding is bird-friendly glass is becoming very difficult to acquire nowadays. Um, so, so, you know, this isn't just one thing. And so in, in trying to find a way to sort of formulate how do we divide these things up, it made sense that something that would normally come to us for a reason, because we don't look at the facade of every building that's developed in the city of Evanston, um, but anything that would come to us for a site allowance or something along those lines would come back to us since we had already given a recommendation to city council on those particular items. Um, but in looking at the current structure that currently exists, um, people can drastically change a building uh, with a minor variation um, that ends at the zoning administrator. Um, so. Ms. Klotz can actually approve um, up to 19.99% change in the open space of a project without it being before any commission or any public hearing other than DAPR. Um, so the idea was to try to draw a delineation between what makes sense. So the idea was something that we have already kind of given our approval to in a recommendation um, we would again have to look at and make a second recommendation on any changes to that approval. Um, I do have one question because I'm, it, it gets a little confusing in the way that we're wording this. So that a change that would increase the degree of an approved site development allowance. If we're talking about parking, an increase is actually a decrease in parking and a decrease is actually an increase in parking on site, correct? Correct. I just want to make sure that that's, that's understood um, because that's, that's what we're, 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 we're giving the, the recommendation of approval for a greater impact. So if a building shrinks in height, um, we had one come to us recently that dropped six feet or something like that, and it was put in just because of the parking change that was going on as well. Um, but if a building for some reason was dropping its height and really didn't need any other change, that would not be something that that would come through the process for us. I, those words stuck out to me too as hard, you're right, there's it's, lots it's of- It's an increase it's in impact it's versus a decrease in impact. I, I'm not a, I'm not gonna wordsmith this, but I, I think those, that should be clearer. It's not clear to me for those reasons. The, the full true text of the text amendment has not been developed at this point, um, but staff can be sure to work with the chair to make sure that it is clarified on what we mean by an increase in the degree. I of think it should be an increased on. impact or a decreased impact because that's really what we're talking about is the impact that the building has on neighboring properties or the city as a whole. Additionally, an option for a noticing requirement for minor adjustments, um, wording could be added that allows n uh, public notice uh, at the council member's discretion so that if they feel it is a significantly impactful minor adjustment, then we I, do a public I, notice. I really am not in favor of that because then it's like, well, that project was noticed, but that one wasn't because Alderman Kelly felt this was important and Alderman Wynn didn't think this was important or whatever it is. And it becomes, I'd rather us have a clear cut process. Um, if the process is no notifications, um, council members can give their own notifications but I don't want us to get into having competing notifications going out either, like we've had before. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, practical, absolutely practical question. Let's say this happens again, somebody with uh, changes to a project. When the permit for a project is issued, 
is there a kind of a warning in the permit that a change may trigger minor or major variation? Can we enforce that? Because, for instance, in the last example that we had here in front of us, it was too late, but the developer a kind of a confessed that during the process of construction and during all the inspections, they made the changes, but they came to us at the end of the process. And probably, I don't know whether they knew that this will trigger a variation or not, but let's say somebody will say, I didn't know that this will have to go through the same process again. So is it possible, for instance, at the issuance of the permit, that the conditions of the minor or major variation are put in the permit so that any general contractor or developer knows that if he or she changes something in the project, they will have to come back. Um, I think one of the ways to address that is any any plan development, any special use requires an ordinance to be written. And so that would be the logical place to put it is in the ordinance. So that as the ordinance grants the various site allowance um, that we that city council ultimately grants that we recommend, that part of that wording in that ordinance would be if sure. a change to, and again, whatever the, incre whatever the language we come up with, if, if there is a greater impact created by a change, it would require this. If anything else changes, it would require this. Yeah. And that just becomes boilerplate that goes into any of our plan development special use ordinances. Thank you. If that makes sense to staff. Perfect. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Chair Rogers, if I may as well, um, I wanted to note that, you know, Projects often during construction, as you may know, th things can happen in the field and they can issue a change order. So oftentimes it would just be a post permit revision. So we do have opportunities to review and check if they are compliant with something like the plan development ordinance. And of course the elevations are attached. So then we can as staff make sure that the materials in the particular case we're talking about with the um, Anne Rainey apartment building are consistent. Um, I think what the intent of the amendment is, and from what I understand the commission's intent, is how to provide some lev some flexibility within the code and what staff can administratively approve. So as projects are not stopping halfway through or 90% through construction, um, unduly without requiring further public meetings. Um, because the construction process, things can change, and as we've seen, the supply chain issues are impacting multiple developments. Um, but to your point, we do check the permit plans for compliance with the plan development ordinances that come forward, and there is also the permit revision process. If we've already signed off, they need to submit for, we, we have to basically review it again, and if we flag it, um, I think in this case, maybe there was a little bit of delinquency in notifying the city, um, but that's the intent. I think we also have to look at this as a, the past two years and probably the next year, um, hopefully that's all the longer it is, are kind of an abnormality. Um, we had city staff who was working from home who didn't have access to certain elements of things, um, was not necessarily as responsive. We have developers who are running into supply chain issues that are happening and impacting more than just a single developer. Um, so I, I think we need to kind of look at this as in five years, what is a good policy? What is a good process that we have in place? Mm -hmm. and, and so I don't want us to get too hung up on one or two specific projects or properties because I don't think that these are going to be the norm once we sort of get back to, and if they do become the norm, then we adjust, we rewrite things and adjust things at that time. I, I just, there's, I'm stuck on one thing and I, I just want to be clear on this. Um, and, and I'm sorry to use that project as an example, but 
Um, in under this new wording, if the pro if that project, if you if if uh, when they applied for a uh, inspection and you guys flagged flagged it uh, under this process, would then that go directly to planning and development? Correct. Okay. And my question is, in 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 the other wording. Would it go to the planet? It would go to us, right? In the previous wording. I, I guess I'm asking whether uh, we're we're um, shirking our duties by passing this along to planning and development, and maybe they think that maybe they want our opinion on these things, and that right, what this is doing is saying, uh, no, sorry, you take it. I don't know. Uh, but, but they've already but they've already approved through years saying that they don't want our opinion on a change in an open space or a change in moving the building, because that's the way the ordinance currently exists. Um, we actually are making everything now have to go to a city council level um, as opposed to just the things that come through us, because even th things currently can be decided by staff. So if anything, we're increasing city council's role in any of these projects yeah and you know and I think that that's kind of you know if you're looking at you know decreasing you know the changing the facade or building materials or if you can't get the bird friendly glass those are all kind of city policies already that that perhaps the city council ought to know that that changes being made so that the bird friendly Evanston people don't show up, you know, a city council meeting and say, why did staff, you know, okay a different kind of glass? So I, th I think that it, it makes sense to, to have certain of these things go to the city council. Although I think there, there ought to be kind of some, like on the facade and building materials, it's, it's like, you know, if, if you, or changing the color or the type of corrugated steel you're using as a decorative trim, I'm, you know, it, it ought to be, the thing that goes to city council ought to be something that's kind of dramatically different or a substantial change or a... And staff would make that call. Well, not, as, not necessarily as it's written right now. It's either one or the, it's either a major adjustment and it comes to us or it's a minor adjustment and it goes to um, the city but, council. But city, so the question, the city, question, city council has the purview, though, to kick anything to us. Yes. If they feel it's a significant change, city council can say we don't feel comfortable making this decision. Well, they can't. But I, but my, where I was going is, is, is there a, a, a set of circumstances where staff does make the call, or should there be a? No, but I mean, is is there is there a, a level where there's a minor enough change that staff can approve the 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 change? There essentially is. Um, the project must be within substantial compliance of what was originally approved. So staff does have that discretion to determine whether it is substantial compliance or not. If not, then it would. Um, correct. Any other thoughts, discussion? I mean, I think it gets a little confusing because we use the term minors and majors, but they mean different things when you're talking about an adjustment to a plan development versus a, um, a zoning variance versus um, a fence versus <laughs> everything else. Um, it gets a little confusing because everything's either a major or a minor, but they don't necessarily correlate across the different platforms. Um, but if there's no further discussion, um, we have a proposal here that would go to City Council with a recommendation from us. Um, is there a motion to move this on to City Council with a recommendation? I believe you have standards for approval. We have yeah, I'm to sorry. But I, I just want to get kind of a gauge, yeah. like, is everybody kind of okay in the direction we're going? 
Okay. Um, so we do have uh, text amendment standards that we do have to go through, but before I went through them, I kind of wanted to get a general feel mm -hmm. since I go through a lot of standards. Um, You're so good at it. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the standards for text amendments, there are four of them. Um, the first one is whether the proposed amendment is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the Comprehensive General Plan as adopted and amended from time to time with City Council. Um, I believe that this is in compliance. Um, obviously, we are trying to make things a little easier for people to understand, a little more logical in terms of if it's something that comes before this, this commission uh, for a site allowance uh, granted, uh, our recommendation for a grant of that, um, that they would continue to come to us for those things, but things that are pot potentially more impactful that are currently not coming to us would come to us and things that are uh, potentially less impactful um, would still get th go through a process that would go to city council so there still would be an approval and a public meeting um, so I believe that this standard has been met. Number two, the proposed amendment is compatible with the overall character of existing development in the immediate vicinity of the subject property. Um, this kind of kind of helps uh, tie in to making sure that properties continue um, once they are approved by, by the City Council to, to be in substantial compliance with the, the original ordinance that grants them their plan development. Um, and I think that, that that's a check on making sure that things do continue to, to be compatible with, with things around them um, so that standard is met. Number three, whether the proposed amendment will have an adverse in effect on the value of adjacent properties. Uh, again, this is a text amendment that tries to make things a little more um, clear as to where things go when a change needs to be made and, and who has to make it, um, which hopefully will, will make things a little clearer and allows for for any, any changes that, that will have a greater impact, for example, the moving of a building or less green space, um, will actually have to come through this commission as opposed to um, just being approved on the staff level. So I believe that uh, we actually are helping protect the value of the adjacent properties um, by, by this change. And number four, the adequacy of public facilities and services. I don't know that this really applies. I mean, this is this is kind of one of those things where um, anything that changes um, under the old system with a lot of the utility relocation, that sort of stuff, was a minor variation. Um, it will continue to be handled sort of in the same way, um, and but it will actually actually have to be approved by city council um, as opposed to just being approved by staff if it's if it's major enough. Um, so I believe that standard is met as well. Is everyone in agreement with my findings on standards? I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, so I will ask if there is a motion to recommend approval of the text amendment. I uh, move uh, that we recommend uh, uh, approval of the uh, proposed text amendment uh, forward uh, with positive recommendation to the City Council. Okay. Can I amend that with the suggestion that you made on the wording? Yes. Oh, yes. Accepted. <laughs> and do you second then? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> okay. So moved by Lindwald, seconded by Halleck. Um, and I will ask for roll call vote, please. Commissioner Halleck. Commissioner Hugo. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Linwall? Yes. Commissioner Mirenchev? Yes. Chair Rogers? Yes. With a six to zero vote, the motion does carry and it will be moved forward to um, City Council with a recommendation for approval uh, with that one change uh, being included in the language. Um, let me go back to my agenda here. Is there any. Um, Communications from the staff. Um, Commissioner Halleck, are you going to ask your question or are you going to pass this week? I, I got the mic ready. Um, 
<laughs> no, I just I just wanted to um, put it on the record that we have um, received a quorum for a special meeting on um, November 30th uh, related to the Margarita Inn um, application that has been received for a special use permit. Um, and then also just quickly, um, comprehensive plan update. Uh, so staff will be meeting um, to start pulling together a new outline for an RFP that we will issue uh, for that update process. Our intention is to circle back and bring that forward for more um, discussion, uh, date yet to be determined. Thank you. Um, is there any other issues that need to be brought before us? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Move, move by Halleck. Any a second? second? Seconded by Johnson. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 We stand adjourned.